Uh, this is the fourth panel I've taught at MAGFest now. And yes, I said it correctly. Um, I taught three yesterday, I'm teaching one today, and I'm teaching one more on Sunday. Um, do a little bit of everything, but I went to college in Japan and my master's was back here in the States uh, on Japanese economics. And one of the things I always like to focus on um, is Japanese video games. Uh, I am legally blind. I was born with a um, disability called ocular albinism, and my eye doctor when I was 10 year old told me to start playing games. And I didn't stop. <laughs> Um, so, not only video games, but board games have been a huge passion of mine. Yes, they've helped me increase my ability to read small print, but they're also just plain fun. Um, and I fell in love with some of the more classic Japanese games. Uh, and we're going to be taught starting way back, moving all the way to present day, giving you a little bit of an overview. Um, I'd say about 80 or 90 percent of this panel is talking about classic games and then we're going to do sort of a blitz of some of my favorite modern day Japanese board games which are also available in English and can be bought um, locally in your game shops or on Amazon with English lettering and English descriptions so that even if you don't understand a lick of Japanese you can play along. Um, I will not be covering um, first look type games, Jap games that are not available internationally because unfortunately that's not going to be useful to a lot of people here. Um, however, some of these classic games I will be covering uh, that you probably haven't heard of before as well as things like Shogi and Go, which I will keep short because I'm sure some of you at least have heard of them in passing. I'm going to be doing this in historical order starting from the oldest to the newest. And here's a little bit of an overview, and this is a lot of words that you may not know. So the things that are dotted are the names of our actual games. We're moving from Go all the way to Richie Mahjong, which is actually a very recent invention, followed by um, some modern day board games. And the things that are not dotted, those are the time periods in which they first appeared. Or there's some, or some record of for our oldest things, which is the pre-Nara period, um, because that is pre- written Japanese. <laughs> Alright, so before I move on, I'm going to be talking about some terminology that we're going to be hearing a lot of during this panel. Um, and the classic games I'll cover really fall into one of these four major categories. We've got abstract games, roll and move games, trick taking games, and dexterity games. Um, you guys may have heard some of this techno terminology before, but I want to keep everyone up to speed. Uh, by the way, I do see you with your camera. If you want a copy of this panel afterwards, um, I'll have my cards up here. I'm happy to email it to you. So, you're welcome to take pictures. Not, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you are, but if you want the actual panel, I'm, I'm also happy to share. Um, so an abstract game is a game that lacks theme. Um, and then, Anything that I have bolded here are the games we're going to cover, and then there's some, also some examples of Western games that you might be more familiar with as a comparison. So that's the games we're covering, or Go, Shogi, uh, Go, Moko, and Renju, and you might know this, Chess, Checkers, Backgammon. Uh, these are all abstract games. Roll and move games um, are games where you roll a dice, or a spinner, or something else that tells you how many spaces to move, and then you move that many spaces, and if there's an action involved, you do that action. A lot of roll and move games are also abstract games, so backgammon is not only an abstract game, it's also an abstract roll and move. Um, chess, shoots and ladders, sorry, even though sorry uses cards, still it's a random, you're drawing a card that tells you what, how many you move, and you move that many spaces. Um, both versions of Sugoroku. Yes, there's two games that we're talking about that are called Sugoroku that are totally different from one another. Um, they have different kanji, which is the Japanese writing system, but they're pronounced identically. Both of them are roll and move games, but they're very different. <laughs> Trick-taking games. Uh, these are games where you are trying to rack up points with a predetermined scoring system. So, um, Euchre and Hearts, a lot of card games uh, use a trick-taking system. Um, other games that have a trick-taking system involved, but it's not the main mechanic. Sushi Go is a trick-taking game. Um, yes, it's also um, uh, a, not a deck builder, but when you're making hands of cards. 
name is escaping me at the moment. Um, drafting, thank you. Yeah, it's also a drafting game, but the points are scored via trick-taking system. Uh, Richie Mahjong is considered trick-taking, and a lot of the cards and games, which is my actual area of expertise, uh, those are all trick-taking games as well. Lastly, we have dexterity games. Um, and these are games like Jenga, where physical skill is the primary indicator. Um, usually no cards are involved. But, interestingly enough, the one dexterity game um, that, that we're going to be covering, which is actually still very popular in Japan today, is Menkel, and it actually does use cards. And it's not a stacking game. So, I'm going to give you some context via the history of this time period, uh, because a lot of games are a product of their time. Uh, just like how post-war German games are mostly non-confrontational due to a lot of their laws preventing um, blood visible in, in their games, um, a lot of games, even historical ones, are products of the time period in which they are created. Early history Os Osco period is the first period we're going to cover, and it's the start of the direct influence from China. So a lot of the games coming out of this period are games that were brought directly over from China, either modified for Japanese tastes or just wholesale identical games. Um, Buddhism also not only, um, interestingly enough, games, but a writing system. So art was able to flourish, and writing actually became a thing in Japan. Um, Japan does not have its own native writing system. Uh, it uses the Chinese kanji, as well as what are called kanas, which are sort of an alphabet, that are based off of simplifications of those kanji characters. So pictographs, and then sound characters that are based off of them. And our very first game is Go. The Grand Japanese Japanese Games is not a Japanese game at all. It is a Chinese one. Um, it was developed in China about 1000 BCE, so um, a little over a thousand years ago. It was in, in the Zhou Dynasty. It was brought to Korea in 400 CE, so uh, about 1600, sorry, uh, 1000 uh, BCE is 3000 years ago. Uh, brought to Korea in 400 CE, so about 1600 years ago and then traveled via Korea and the Korean Peninsula to Japan. Uh, in the 8th century, the imperial court became, uh, it became popular in the court, and then in the 13th century in the general public. And continues to be popular in Japan to this day. Now, it is a very complex abstract game in the way that we consider chess to be a battle, go as a war. Uh, it is, in essence, one of the easiest things to teach and one of the hardest things to learn. Your goal is to surround the most territory. Yes, you can surround enemy pieces to capture them, but that's not necessarily the best way to score. And as you can see here, it's pretty easy to follow how people are starting to capture and move across the board, but actually playing it is very difficult. Um, I have a hard time visualizing go myself. Uh, Go is also one of the oldest games along with chess that sort of captured the imagination um, from its inception in, in, uh, in both China as well as in Korea and Japan. Uh, there's plenty of intrigue stories, art, poetry, and, and other forms of art surrounding this board game in the same way that we have um, a mystique surrounding chess. Um, all the way up to things like Hikaru no Go, which is a very famous Japanese manga about the board game, which almost single-handedly revitalized the game as a competitive sport among kids. Our second game of this time period is Suguroku, or at least one of them. Um, and it is a form of backgammon. Now we think of backgammon as a Western game, and that's sort of true. But backgammon, like a lot of other things, traveled in both directions, east and west. And as it traveled eastward, it modified itself, morphed into Suguroku as we know it. Enough today, because it is not really a game that is played anymore. Um, the rules slowly fell out of favor. Sorry, guys. <laughs> the, 
Um, the rules slowly fell out of favor in favor of the Western style backhand, which did eventually travel its way back to Japan via trade. Um, it's not the only thing that's traveled in both directions. What are our days of the week? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. What are the Japanese days of the week? The first day is a moon day. The second day is a fire day. Well, Tuesday is also um, Mars, fire. It uses the same set of planets going all the way across, just the Japanese planets use the elements to label them. It came from the same source. People are assuming both came from roughly the Middle East or India and spread in both directions. Um, the only reason why we know about Sugoroku at all, this version at least, um, is from art and some vague recollections of people describing the rules. Moving on to the Heian period. Now the Heian period was when the capital of Japan moved from Nara to Kyoto. Uh, it was an incredibly peaceful period. Uh, nobles were had a lot of time. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a um, strike-free period, but as far as Japan was concerned, internally it was free from war. Um, it was a massive flourishing of Japanese art and culture uh, because the nobility weren't fighting amongst themselves. They were, they had a lot of time for art. Um, this was also the first period in which uh, Japanese women began to read and write. Uh, the kana that I had mentioned before, the, sy the simpler systems of writing were developed, and women, the women's uh, ability to learn to read and write flourished, which means board games and board game rules also started to flourish. And we have Japan's first natively produced board game. This is Gomoku. It looks a lot like Go. It has the word Go in it, even though it's a completely different character. In this case, Go is five. It may look like Go, it may use the same pieces as Go, but it is not Go. It is not even close to Go. It is most closely related to Connect Four. Um, it is Connect Four with a lot more rules. <laughs> um, it's also often called the most complex game of tic-tac-toe. It is essentially a five in a row game, but how you can score five depends on what color you are. Black plays first and has advantage, uh, and it makes sense. Chess and checkers use the same board. So if you've already got a go board and go pieces lying around, why not use them to create new games? We do this all the time too. Moving forward a little bit further, and this is the Kamakura period. There was civil war and Mongol invasions, but there was still time for board games. Here's the other form of Suguroku, and this game version, which is a completely different game with completely different characters, has survived to this day and is still quite popular in Japan. There's a couple reasons. One, like I said before, during the Kamakura period, uh, Japan was in a period of civil war, so a lot of people didn't travel. And the earliest forms of Suguroku, this version, which is very similar to the game of life, um, were maps of Japan, and people could travel through it and go on little adventures. Um, and it was very easy to pick up and play for a couple of reasons. One, because it was played on a piece of paper, you could, you could uh, easily mass produce these, even during this time period, via block printing. And two, because it's a piece on a piece of paper, modern day versions have flourished because you can stick one of these in a child's magazine, and they can play it with tokens or coins or whatever that they already have in their house. Uh, you might have seen in, as a child in games of, in, in a Highlights magazine or whatever, uh, very simple board games. In Japan, Sugoroku is very common. And as you can see, this is a, I'm trying to remember which, which anime this is from. I think this is One Piece? Uh, but the, the, huh? Yo, uh, what did you say? Yo, Mushi Pedal, oh, the, the, um, the bicycle anime. And the, the, the magazines that would have this in there, modern day, you'd have punch outs that you could also pop out and you'd have a board game you could play on the go. So it is a roll and move game, just like the game of life where where you stop 
tells you what kind of action you have to do. Some versions, it's just go back X number of spaces. But a lot of the children's games is you have to do some kind of action to be allowed to move forward and not be penalized, like um, write a kanji. So it's, it's, it, there's some educational aspect to it as well, depending on which version you are using. Now, the end of the Kamakura period and the beginning of the Muromachi period um, sees the rise of Karuta. And the reason why is Europeans come. Karuta is literally cards. Um, Europeans start arriving in Japan, most notably the Dutch, and they bring their own cards with them. Now, we think of a modern 52-card deck, but this is the 1500s that didn't even exist in in Europe at that time. What they had were cards that looked a lot closer to tarot cards that were used for playing board games. And so these are the kinds of cards that end up getting turned into all different kinds of karuta. These are four variants that have more or less still survived to this day, although it's with the exception of Hanafuda, a lot of them are very regionalized. Um, while the original decks were Japanese-made games using these Dutch decks. Uh, the Japanese government tried to crack down on foreign influence, and so as you can see, as we move further and further, they either start turning into Japanese imagery, or they start becoming more and more abstract. And each of these kinds of decks are a little different. Um, some of them have wilds, like Kabafuda, um, and some of them have five suits, um, the most famous of these, of course, is Hanafuda, literally meaning flower cards. Now, this is a Nintendo deck. In fact, this is the deck that was produced for the 100th anniversary of Nintendo, because what did Nintendo originally produce? Playing cards. They were a playing card manufacturer. Now, one thing of note is karuta is very different from Western style playing cards. For one, they're much smaller. They're about this big. And you know what? Why don't I pull out this deck? I should have put this on the top of my bag. Hindsight's 2020. I know, that was a bad joke.
and still play and let your opponent move and then you move trying to make additional sets. But the minute that your opponent makes a set, they collect all the points and the round is over. So it is a press your luck kind of game as well. Um, there are other games that can be played with this deck, just like a deck of playing cards. There's many games from one deck, but that is the most popular. It's also a gambling game. So you're actually betting money on this. The interesting thing though is, a lot of these games that we're, that we're covering were originally gambling games. So was the first Sugoroku. Uh, one of the possible reasons why it fell out of existence was the ban of gambling uh, at the end of that period. Which, well, without gambling, who wants to play it? <laughs> There's some other forms of karuta as well. And these are called e oase karuta, e meaning pictures. Um, so even though, yes, there were pictures on the other forms of karuta we just saw, uh, these are strictly focused on, on the pictures as well as the poetry. On the left we have uta uh, karuta, and on the right we have iroha karuta. Um, the ones on the left are most commonly played at a incredibly heated game typically played at New Year's time. So right around now in Japan, when I lived there, I would be playing with my host family and getting my ass kicked to heaven come. <laughs> um, there are multiple games that can be played with this deck, but the most common kind is that there's a beginning of a poem on one card and the end of it on another. And it's a matching game. Someone flips over a beginning, and everybody's scrambling to find the equivalent match. Most people who are good and who play this tournament uh, in a tournament can figure out which poem it is by the first syllable, first two. This game can break families. However, like I mentioned before about gambling, guess what? There's a gambling variant to this game. And in that game, the poems don't matter. It's actually, you're actually trying to make sets um, by the colors and types of clothing the poets are wearing, completely ignoring the poets themselves. And different, different sets are actually worth different amounts of points for, for again, real money. Et Iroha Karuta, on the other hand, Iroha is their version of the ABCs. Um, there is a phrase in Japanese, which I can't remember the entire thing off the top of my head, but they have a version of the quick back brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, which is one long sentence poem that uses every syllable in the Kana language. And so all of them are represented on these decks, and it's played very similarly where it's a matching based game. Lastly, we have Obake Karuta. Uh, now this is um, a specific variant of karuta that is found typically only outside of Tokyo. Uh, it is very rarely played anymore, but it is one of the influences for Pokemon, so I had to include it here. Um, all of the cards, obake, are different kinds of monsters and demons, and all of the cards, again, it's a kind of matching game, you're finding um, different kinds of monsters and pairing them off. The Edo period. This is now in the 1600s to 1800s. Uh, in the Edo period, it was the end of the Civil War. Japan is reunited, massive economic growth, um, but at the same time, isolationism. Japan kicked out all of those foreigners, even though before then they were allowed to enter at certain points. Now they're only allowed in one specific city, and popular culture starts to develop. With the uh, although the um, Japanese uh, block presses had been in existence for a while, now you can easily transport those things without fear of being um, attacked on the highway. Because of popular culture, we start getting more popular games. Yes, Go is uh, a game that's, that's been played now for hundreds of years across Japan, but we have Shogi, and this is a much closer variant to chess. Like Go is a war, Shogi is down to just a battle. Um, <laughs> this is the first game in Japan that's chess-like, and not only that, but with returnable pieces. So, um, returnable pieces means that there are ways to get things off of the board, but also ways to get them back on the board. Um, shogi, like chess, if you're able to fulfill the win condition for a piece, um, for pawns in, in chess, you get to pick what they change into, aka you're always picking the queen. <laughs> shogi 
Halloween, however, you don't get to pick what a piece turns into um, when it advances. Each of them turns into an entirely new piece by flipping it over. And changes how that they how they move and, ex and, and expand on the board. So as you can see here, you've got the um, the silver and gold generals. You've got the bishop. Each of these pieces moves a specific way, and when it promotes, it moves in an entirely new way. Not necessarily better, just different. Yep. Yep. Um, and my, my personal favorite piece is the elephant. It's very, uh, it acts kind of like a, uh, um, a, 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 a chess knight, but it's just different enough to be interesting. Um, there are, uh, unfortunately when you buy a shogi set, it's always going to have the kanji characters on it, um, but the easiest way to play is to sit down with a reference guide. And it does play very similar to chess. People take turns, you move a piece, that's it. You move a piece, the opponent moves a piece, etc. back and forth across the board until you take your opponent's king. Just like you do in, in, our, in, in, in Western style chess. So there are lots of clubs for both Go and Shogi in most major cities. So if you live near one or if you live near a college campus, chances are you'll be able to give this a try. Um, also, since this is DC, um, I live in Philly, as you can probably tell by my accent. <laughs> Um, most major areas that have cherry blossom trees have a cherry blossom festival, and that's a, usually a great time to pick up and learn how to play either go or shogi, as regional um, uh, uh, clubs usually present there. I know at the DC uh, cherry blossom festival, both the go and shogi teams are present, as well as mahjong. Um, I know at the Philly one, go and shogi are both present as well. And now we have one of the most interesting games on this list, and this is the trick-taking game, uh, the uh, dexterity game I mentioned before. This is Mengel. I'm sure you've heard of Pogs. These are the original Pogs. Remember I said that this period is 16 to 1800s? These are three to four hundred year old Pogs. Mengel are, are made on thick cardstock or wood. Um, and they are a flipping game, but what's interesting thing about Minkel is that they don't have a standardized shape. Um, they can be any shape as long as they're the correct thickness. Um, and yes, starting in the 1980s, uh, you start seeing holographic holofoil uh, Minkel before Pogs even hit the market. Uh, as we can see here, um, most of the ones here are from the 1920s to 1940s. We've even got Pinocchio on a Minkel. Um, you can still easily buy these in shops. So here's some holofoil Pokemon Minkel. Uh, the first time I saw these guys, I thought, oh, these are really weird Pokemon cards. Where's their stats? They're not Pokemon cards. They're Minkel. And then, of course, you get to take, your, you get to take the uh, loser's Minkel home with you and you can start amassing a collection. Gotta catch them all, right? All right, now we're moving into the Meiji period. This is the 1860s to 1912. Um, we're going to start seeing color photographs. We're going to start seeing more reintegration with the West as Japan reopens its doors um, in the Industrial Revolution and mass modernization. And we're going to see modernization of our board games too. Remember Gomoku? This is Renju. This is Gomoku with even more rules. And you'd think that a game with even more rules would, act, would be worse. No, this um, version of Gomoku is now a game where no matter who plays, it is a perfectly even and balanced game. Black takes additional penalties, um, such as its row of, uh, it, it must attach its own piece to an end of a previous piece. Um, to remove any kind of advantage it has because black gets to go first. By, by adding these disadvantages to the black player, um, it allows for a perfectly even game. White gets to ignore all those weird, weird rules. Um, and overline, which is when you combine two sets of three, two sets of two to make a five in the middle, white can do it, black is not allowed to. And now 20 countries are part of the international Renju competition. 
which still plays every four years, uh, every six years, alternating uh, men's and women's tournaments. America has never won, even though we are part of this to tournament. You know who's surprisingly really good? Sweden. <laughs> now we're moving into closer and closer to modern day in the Taisho era. Or, um, and early Showa. This is 1912 to 1925. Uh, and Japan, just like the US, had the Roaring Twenties. Uh, this is a block, a very famous block print of a Japanese flapper, um, uh, but also followed by massive debt and first uh, attempts at democracy. And this is just like the Roaring Twenties. We start bringing back some gambling. And now, finally, we've got Rinchi Mahjong. A game that people think is a lot older than it is. It's actually a variant of Mahjong that's only about 80 years old. Um, Mahjong is a game of tiles where you're trying to make sets. When you've completely filled out your set, uh, you, you, you score points. Ricci is a Japanese variant. Now these sticks here that we see on the bottom, these are the Ricci sticks. If you're one tile away from winning and you haven't taken any points, from the from somebody else's pool. Uh, I'm sorry. Are you raising your hand? What's up? No. Go ahead. Oh, that's awesome. So for those of you that didn't hear, if you play Final Fantasy XIV, they're adding Ricci um, to their servers on the eighth. The eighth. Cool. Yeah, there's a lot of um, Japanese video games that actually include Ricci. Um, whether or not you like Sui Coden 4, that was my very first RPG, okay? <laughs> you can laugh. Um, I learned how to play Ricci when I was about 10 or 12, playing it inside of Sui Coden 4. Um, Yakuza games are famous for having Ricci Mahjong in them. Uh, Ricci is very easy to learn, but the scoring system is notoriously a notoriously obtuse. Um, unlike um, what your grandmother, or in my case, my mother plays, which is American Mahjong, um, the scoring doesn't change from year to year. So if you play American style Mahjong, you have to buy that card that tells you what all the sets are worth, and that changes every year. Ricci Mahjong, the sets are always worth the same. There's no card. Um, you can just look it up but it is a little bit obtuse to score. But as I was saying, these Ricci sticks are one of the unique things about Japanese style Mahjong. If you're one tile away from finishing your set, and you haven't used anybody else's tiles, because on your turn you can either pull a tile from the center, or you can pull a tile from someone else's discard. Um, if you're one tile away from winning and you haven't used someone's discard tiles, you can call Ricci, and it's worth a couple extra points when you score, as long as you score before anybody else does. This is another game that breaks families. <laughs> now we're moving into the latter half, which is our modern games. Our first one is one that you guys probably know and probably don't even realize is Japanese, and that's a love letter. Um, this is the American art. The Japanese art is very different. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I am more partial to the American art, but I know a lot of people are very, uh, very um, attached to whatever card set that they worked on, uh, what, they, what they were introduced to first. Uh, Love Letter is a hidden roles game. I'm sure uh, you've heard of at least one of these, Coup, The Resistance, uh, Secret Hitler. Um, they, all, they all play a little bit differently, but one of the things about it is, is that you have a role that you have to play, and you win or you lose by how well you play that role. Love Letter is that distilled down into a single card. Your goal in this game is to get a love letter to the princess, and whoever is left standing, uh, being, being revealed as not holding the letter, Wins. Now the princess is the highest ranked card, so the princess can deliver the letter to herself. Uh, the theming is a bit thin on this one. Um, but everybody takes turns looking at their cards, they draw one, and then they have one in their hand, and they play an action. They play one of their two cards. Princess, for example, cannot be played. So if you've got it in your hand, you're like, well, I've got the highest rank, I'm going to win if I survive, but I can't ever use it, so you're going to have to use whatever you end up drawing. 
guards are the lowest rank, but they can t they can say, I think you're a, you can say anything but a guard. I think you're the princess. And if you have that in your hand, you're out immediately. It's very quick elimination. The last one standing gets a point, uh, and you play to n number of points. And the points are really cute. They're called tokens of affection. They're little hearts. Welcome to the dungeon. If any of you guys are Shut Up and Sit Down fans in here, you probably know about this one. Uh, but you probably didn't realize it was a Japanese game as well. Because here's the interesting thing. Just because the game is Japanese doesn't mean it has a Japanese theme or art. Conversely, just because a game has Japanese theming or art, such as Takaido, does not mean it comes from Japan. Welcome to the Dungeon is very Western RPG styled. Uh, it is also an elimination game, but it is a game about screwing over your friends. <laughs> um, yes, it is, it is probably one of my favorite games about screwing over your friends. So everybody's playing a class, a bard, a rogue, whatever, uh, a wizard, and you all have your items in front of you. And you all have monsters, and you're slowly adding monsters to a dungeon. And your items let you do certain things, like you might have a potion that lets you ignore all zombies in the deck. You might have some you might have a stake so you can ignore all vampires. You might have something where you're invisible to monsters stronger than five. But as you keep going, you slowly start to have more monsters in the deck, and you start to lose your items. Somebody's got to enter that dungeon, and it's either going to be you or you bail. Last person standing goes in with whatever items they have left, and it's resolved whether or not they got the item, or they die a horrible death. You get two items, you win. You die two horrible deaths, you're out of the game. Deep Sea Adventure. This is another push your luck game, and it takes about five minutes to play. This is another game about dicking over your friends. It may look cute and adorable, but your goal is to steal the best treasure from underseas uh, without uh, running out of oxygen, because that would be bad. Um, so as you can see here, uh, there's tiles with different dots that determines their depth, as well as X's where treasures have already been taken. Uh, you, can, it's, you roll to figure out how deep you can go, and whether or not you want to take a treasure, then everybody has to scramble back up to get to the sub before oxygen runs out. But you don't necessarily know. Deeper, deeper in the ocean has better treasures, but you could have ended up with a dud. You don't know until the end of the game how well you actually have scored until you drop your treasure. Here's my favorite game of the bunch. And it looks ugly, but I promise you it's a really interesting game. And this is a deck builder called Trains. It is not a train game. So train games, like um, 18xx games, are games about building and running a rail company. This is, this is a game about building and running a rail company, but it's neither obtuse nor requires um, seven math degrees to be able to parse. Uh, your deck is your train company. And you continue. You can you can buy things with the with the money that you've earned. Uh, any money you don't spend at the end of your turn is gone, so you might as well use it um, to buy more things for your train company. But you don't have to buy trains. You can also buy real estate. You can buy uh, houses and hotels and amusement parks to connect your train empire to. Even if you don't put a train on the board, uh, the game ends when half the card decks that are out are depleted, aka purchased, or someone has put down all of their rails. Those white things on the board, those are stations. You can only put stations down where you see a station icon. You only get points for stations if you connect to one. A station with nobody on it is worth nothing, but anybody on a station gets that many points. So you're trying to manage not only the board, but your deck simultaneously. Oh, and there are twice as many card types as the kinds you play with, so every time you play, it's a completely different game. It's another one of my favorites, and this is Machi Koro. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of this one as well. Um, this is basically uh, a game of craps where you set your own odds. So you start the game with two holdings. You're the mayor of a small town that's slowly trying to expand. 
and each of these holdings say on a specific roll, you get this amount of money. Now, you'll slowly start accruing money, and hey, maybe you want to buy something that when you land on that same number, you get twice as much money. Or maybe you want to buy something so that no matter what you roll, you will start earning money. Uh, and you slowly build up this empire. Uh, you have four cards that you're building towards, which are very expensive to buy, but give you massive bonuses. Once you've built your fourth, the game is over and it's scored, and whoever has built it first immediately wins. Um, it's fast, it's quick, it's easy to learn from kids, and it's all the thrill of gambling without any of the crying. <laughs> Yeah, um, I did end up finishing a little earlier than expected, but were you paying attention? Because guess what? I'm not keeping this deck with me. Someone's walking home with it. This is the gray edition of the 100th anniversary deck, and I'm gonna want three people up here to, to attempt to win it. All right, I heard an oh, oh I heard a snap. And of the people in the back, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 20. First one to shout it out, you get one chance. That was it, it was 16. <laughs> get up here. All right, we're gonna play standard buzzer rules. First one to raise their hand gets an attempt at the question. If you get it right, you get a point. If you get it wrong, you lose a point, and the pa it'll pass to someone else. Some of these may have more than one answer, so anything that is right counts. All right, by the, um, I'm gonna say, you can read it, but I'm gonna say them aloud. When I finish the, the entire sentence, then you can raise hand. Yeah, all right, that way I can see you guys too. All right, what is the most common game played with? No, I didn't finish my sentence. What is the most common game played with Hanafuda? Yes, one, two, Renju is a modern day competitive version of which classic game? Um, Two. Nice, so we got zero, one, one. What is a trick taking game? Correct, we've got a tie. Number four, what is the original board side for Go? Yes! Finally, on what Japanese holiday... <laughs> are Ewasi Karuta games typically played? Blue. Correct. Alright, we've got two people now. Thank you for your try. Sit down. So we've got a, we've got a, we've got a tie here, and how do we break ties here? I card. Good. 